My name is John Harrison. Welcome to a day in the life of an Egyptian archaeologist. We will continue our discussion with Dr. Mohammed Solomon about his project in Kyoto, Japan and Alexandria, Egypt. However, today we are honored to speak with a living legend, Dr. Farouk Elbaz. He is an Egyptian-American space scientist and geologist who worked for NASA's Apollo program as supervisor of lunar science planning. He also served as secretary of the Lunar Landing Site Selection Committee and chaired the astronaut training group. Additionally, Dr. Albaz was the director of the Center for Remote Sensing at Boston University and a research professor in its archaeology department. Welcome, Dr. Albaz. Please meet Dr. Soliman. He is an Egyptian archaeologist. He is currently in Kyoto, Japan, learning about remote sensing and GIS to understand the history of Alexandria better to develop sustainable strategies that include enhancing people's lives. His PhD research focused on the water installations in Alexandria, Egypt. We thought it would be enormously helpful to get your insights on Dr. Solomon's project, the links between geology and archeology, span and the application of remote sensing and GIS in these two fields. There is really no difference between archeologists and geologists. The only real difference is the, the scale of time. Geologists look at the history of the earth from the beginning of the earth when the earth was born. Archaeologists think about the human beings when they began to roam around the earth. Maybe the human beings moved around for the last four million years, but the geologists think about the earth in the last four billion years. So the difference is in the millions versus billions. Because when you are close to the terrain, to the scene where you're studying, you can see some things right there because of the fact that you can interpret what is here and what's happening. But the view from above, first by a, a, a plane and then by a satellite image, can show you the whole region and it's the, the regional setting of the place that you're staying in and that is very different and that's very essential. It's very important to see how human beings came here and why did they come here specifically rather than somewhere else. And what did they find in here specifically? Was it because it's lower or because it's higher so they can see from Iraq? So you, the, the view of the region as a whole is very important to your understanding of the little place that you're looking at. Uh, first, at uh, NASA, when we were looking at the moon, it was quite an education because here we are looking at some place that we have never seen before. I was looking at images taken by a satellite, an unmanned satellite before the Apollo missions started. Uh, well, the camera, good camera, taking views of, of the whole moon and uh, of, or at least of segments of the moon that the astronauts will fly over. And both the astronauts and we had never seen these things before. So it was up to me to look at them, interpret them, see what is important, what is fine, and when astronauts would go there, what is it that we need them to get us more than what these images were. That they cannot add to it unless they know exactly what is in those things. So they should know what we know so that they can add to our knowledge. So that was a very important thing to do. And from there on, we started looking at pictures from one satellite uh, set to another satellite set. And so the remote sensing became, well, right, we have we used, first we can use a camera. Okay, here are a picture from a photograph, from a regular film. Then we're going to have the multispectral stuff. Here it would look at it from with a different filter and then looking at it a different filter and then putting the two images together to see what is it. Uh, that we can see in addition. So it became to see what is the potential of our increasing our knowledge about the earth and its features from a varied number of sensors. Okay. I was amazed when I got into the program in 1967, about March, I think, yeah. 
and found out that uh, geologists are kind of people that the astronauts hated. One of the astronauts had said, I don't want to see a geologist with a touch a geologist with a 10 foot pole, meaning I don't want to see any of these geologists. And I realized what is that, why, or I started looking into it, and they realized that it's actually because the, astro the astronauts were being taken into uh, classrooms and being taught as if we are getting kids to teach geology one on one and to 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 talking to them about the composition of minerals, the composition of rocks, and, and what the, the, the value of the, these acidic rocks versus the the alkaline materials and all of these things that they will have absolutely nothing to do with. They are not going to have microscopes. They will not look at thin sections. Why are we teaching them that? So there was an immediate question in my mind. What, why are geologists trying to teach astronauts geology the way we were taught? They are not going to be asked geological questions. We need them to, rock, to, to, to collect rocks and as much variety of rocks as we can. And so what is variety? Well, different colors, some that may be crystalline and some are not, some t tight and some, some hard and some friable. This is the variety that, that you can ask somebody that who knows nothing about this material. So don't really talk to them about the variety of rocks. And then the views, especially the views from above, what is it that the astronauts are going to look from? It's none of his business. What, what the composition of these rocks that he's looking at is, might be, and how were they formed. So that's it. He wants to fly the machine. So you have to approach him differently. For instance, when I try to get in this astronaut core and try to uh, get them interested, I picked up lunar pictures covering the whole side of the moon that they are going to fly over. I put them together on a, on a big room and uh, to put the, the orbits in different colors, the first orbit, the second orbit, the third orbit, because these are the first three orbits are very important to fix their location. And during these few orbits, they were going to look through a sextant through the, the, the telescope to try to identify certain points. The, the points were selected by the engineers to say, if they can see this one, we know where they are. And if we can see that one here, then we know where, what the, the flight line uh, looks like or how. So they really wanted to figure out exactly where they're flying. So I put these pictures out there and they put the, the, the orbits and they said, okay, now let's fly over and see what is it that we see. So we will see, and I said before you get to point one, look at the stuff before it so that you can recognize it. Because if you don't recognize it, then you'll miss it. And they give you seven points, you'll miss three or four and you'll get only three. So let's try to get the, the three, but let's even try to get more than the three points so we can really fix the orbital path where you are so we know where you are exactly and figure out because you're, you know where you are, but we don't know where you are relative to the moon. So we're gonna fix this up. So he goes around and he looks at the, we look together at a bunch of uh, uh, craters and he'll look at it and he'll say, look at that doublet. Uh, because there are two craters right next to each other. I said, great, let's call it the doublet because we're gonna remember that. Because your point, uh, mark, landmark one is right after the doublet or between the places where these two, two craters meet. So that the doublet is for point one. And then you will move next to the set. Look at that bunch of craters. They look, <laughs> look at that. They look like a snowman. I write on the machine, on the pictures, snowman. And that, as far as I'm concerned, this becomes the name of that feature, right there, snowman. Because it looked as if, because he figured out that the uh, uh, landmark two is actually on the tip of the head of the snowman. That's it, so he, he knows it. So before he gets to that point where he would say mark, he actually sees the snowman structure or features and then he will go to the head and say mark then we know exactly where his line is meaning that i did not talk geology i did not talk about whatever and i only wanted to have him figure out where he was and make him feel that he's doing a great deal of good because if he figures out three points exactly 
then we know the orbit exactly. So he will always try to find out five points so that rather than three, so he would be better than the last guy that flew over the flag. <laughs> so they began to compete. So I was actually 28, and 20, I was 29 when Apollo 11 landed. Okay. So I was 28 uh, yeah, when I, I was just began to 28 when I joined NASA uh, a year and a half before Apollo 11 uh, landed. And uh, I had never really taken a single course in astronomy. I had never seen the pictures of the moon to, or, or interpretations of what the moon is like or whatever. So this was all news to me. So it was, um, all of it was something new to me. And then right after the Apollo program ended, NASA began a program called the Apollo Soyuz mission, whereby the, a bunch of astronauts from this, uh, the United States of America will join a bunch of astronauts from the Soviet Union and the two of them would link in space, Apollo and the Soyuz, and will actually rot rot around the orbit around the Earth and then take pictures of the Earth and come down as an as a indication of the fact that the two powers are going to cooperate in space. So then NASA guys called me up to say that we are going to have this mission and we want the astronauts to take pictures of the Earth. You are the one that told the astronauts to take pictures of the Moon. You are going to give you this much, and we have two hundred fifty thousand dollars for that job. Come and we'll give it to you, and you get a group and people and make that an experiment and teach these this uh, crews to take pictures of the Earth. I accepted, and they became responsible for the photography and observations from the Earth orbit of the uh, Earth from from space. And this is when I began to look at the Earth from the perspective of space. I began to myself to look at the, I, I, what, how I did it. I brought in experts and the guys that are, have been studying forks and cracks, guys that have been looking at the at mountain ranges, people that are looking at the oceans and ocean currents, people that are looking, you, you name it, everything about the Earth. I collected the best possible, scientists in the U.S. to brief the astronauts on what they knew in my presence so that I will learn too and I will pick up the best, the most important things to do it. And they also brought in people that talked about the deserts and so on because the orbit of the, of the Apollo-Soyuz mission was going to be close to the equator so it will cover nearly all of the deserts of the world. So I thought there would be a great deal of figuring out about the deserts of the world. And this is when I actually uh, began to think about trying to do something good enough for Egypt. And I began to look at the potential of how do, the, how, how do we know, what, what do we know about the desert? So I found out that we really, geologically, we don't know about the desert that much. And I began myself then to figure it out. And, to have questions, simple questions for the, for the geologists. Where did the sand come from? What is the mother of the sand? Where was the sand born? What is the difference between the white sands and the yellow sands and the red sand? Are there chemical composite variations and why? All of these kinds of things. And uh, so I, I actually, to begin to ask these questions, I found out that uh, most of the features of the earth are well studied and well organized and the people that I, they, I brought to, to study the, the mountain ranges and the forts and the tectonics and all of that were quite knowledgeable and they really did know what is the what, except the people that I brought in to talk to the astronauts about deserts and so on. And I, I realized that in geology, as far as I am concerned, we really knew very little about the desert. And this is when I started, I went immediately to my alma mater in Chams University, to one of my professors and one of my, of my uh, college mates. And I started a research program to study the, the desert of Egypt, or well, I said the Western desert of Egypt because it's vast and bigger than anything else and, and will can tell us about North Africa. And so with 19, between 70, uh, 74 and 76, I had something like uh, four to six uh, trips a year 
to go to the desert to do this and that. First, the first thing that we did was figure out from the Apollo Soyuz pictures that the Nile had another delta altogether. The delta of today is very different from the, the delta that used to be. There is, was a delta southwest of the existing delta. And then figuring out where the sand lines come in and where the sand begins and where does it end and how the sand moves and how does the sand change its color from whiter to yellow to red uh, by, 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 as, as, far, as it moves away from the source, meaning closer to the source, it's lighter in color. Much further away from the source, it gets red. All kinds of things that we really never had any, any inkling of, of about them before, which means that we uh, had very little to, to, to know about the desert and the satellite images are telling us a great deal about it, which was something new. And then they continued since then to study the desert using satellite images. First of all, um, allow me to uh, express my gladness to our happiness to be in the same interview with uh, our famous Egyptian scientist, Professor Farouk Lubes. Uh, well, uh, as for my research, basically it is about conducting basic, uh, uh, advanced technology to archaeology and uh, heritage research. Uh, my objective is our case, uh, case study first of all is about Alexandria over ages. So uh, I I aim to I aim to uh, get investigate Alexandria first from uh, 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 archaeological layers to the historical cities. Okay. Okay. And. Uh, uh, Basically, I need to investigate, or I aim to investigate Alexandria using uh, a remote center and GIS. First of all, I, to identify uh, uh, the outline of Alexandria, uh, specifically using the advanced technology, uh, and based on, or using, first of all, uh, 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 using the uh, old maps, which did back to maybe the first map of Alexandria back to uh, the 15th century, uh, uh, while the last survey had been carried out in Alexandria back in 1945. But recently, we, we have now it's the time of remote sensing to get uh, uh, identify the contemporary Alexandria. Uh, basically, a remote sensing and GIS in my, in my research uh, would be useful to identify all, uh, all of that. And uh, basically, uh, as you know, probably Dr. Michael, uh, Alexandria is so crowded, basically, uh, all the Alexandria, which I need, is very crowded and still inhabited. So it's so difficult for archaeologists to investigate any archaeological features uh, there without using advanced technology. So, uh, and second phase of my research, I, I will uh, execute a uh, uh, field, field trip to Alexandria, maybe after COVID-19 would be finished. I would be uh, trapped to Alexandria to execute that uh, using geophysical application, basically uh, GBR and uh, electromagnetic, maybe after that. Um, Kyoto uh, is the uh, historical uh, capital of Japan over uh, 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 10 centuries. I mean, 1,000 years as a capital of Japan. And also, uh, Kyoto has uh, uh, around 17 World Heritage Sites. Uh, uh, so that they have a very um, brilliant model for site management using advanced technology, mainly uh, uh, GIS and remote sensing which I'm here to, uh, to learn and promote my research in that field. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, Rich University, which I have uh, attached to it, uh, 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 over, uh, uh, all facilities uh, such as uh, uh, advanced uh, 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 tools, advanced uh, means of research, uh, satellite, satellite images, and the other uh, software to the uh, 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 my reader. Uh, while uh, for Alexandria, or for Alexandria, uh, the case of Alexandria, 
aj hier in Kyoto just to, to uh, ensure or to be sure of we can achieve something in Alexandria. Because uh, as you know, probably uh, Japan has a limited uh, land property. So, uh, uh, so difficult to uh, uh, move out, uh, to get uh, you move out from a historical site or a, 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 a archaeological site to uh, preserve it. So they have a, a different concept than, uh, other than Egyptian one. Uh, but I'm here to study or to uh, understand how they deal with the, the very complicated relationship between uh, authenticity and the modernization. Because there is a big conflict between uh, uh, developers and preservation of uh, 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 historical or archaeological sites. So that's what I am trying to understand. So that Kyoto is very important to get such as this great opportunity. If uh, uh, Dr. Baz allowed me uh, that I, I want to ask him what is his recommendation and what is, what is uh, 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 if there are other uh, uh, applications or, uh, or technologies could be, it could be uh, enhanced or improve my, my research in this field, which is basically aims to uh, enhance or, uh, 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 life of people uh, because we need in the outline of uh, 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 preserving our heritage but with some uh, a sort of community engagement in this process so wh wh what kind of uh, uh, of recommendation according to that objective uh, it would be uh, advising very good you're looking at a uh, port city that had when had gone through all kinds of changes through time. And to understand these changes through a very long time, you have to figure out how to understand the changes in lesser amounts of time. And I would suggest that you can take the region of Alexandria and get satellite images from of today and as far back as the 70s, the late 70s or early 80s of the same period and look at it every 10 years or so in detail. So to see what happened between 1980 and 1990 in detail. And then what between 1990 and 2000 and 2010 and so on because these, these uh, images taken by Landsat are, are all available and for free for everybody uh, through the internet. So get these pictures and figure out if, if, you can do it every five years if you want to do in detail and, and figure out what the, the changes were exactly in that period of time, maybe in, during the last 50 years when we began to take pictures until today. And then you can, if you, if you figure out exactly what, what did happen in these the changes, then go to the, 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 uh, the sites where you see where most of the changes happen and examine what is it that you see today on the surface, and then perhaps use JPR, the ground penetrating radar, to see how far are the changes that, the, how, how, uh, uh, maybe how much thickness was the change that happened, the addition of human activities were like that, and in here versus in there, near the port, away from the port, near the, the, the uh, exhibit areas, near the, the, the temples or away from the temples where people lived, not where uh, people. So we can begin to figure out exactly what the changes were, how vast the changes in the very different areas of the city, meaning that all of the various parts of the city changed differently and you begin to figure out why the change happened in this versus that and, and, and begin to understand the people themselves of that time and in their, in their immediate uh, environment. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, the, uh, the Alexandria culture changed drastically. Of course, it was at the very beginning, it was the Greek city. And then uh, some with time, people moved into the, the Greek city and changed the, the, the style a little bit. And then came the Armenians and then the Egyptian Jews moved more in Alexandria. And then the Italians came in and the such and such. So there were all kinds of very varied cultures 
that affected the whole region and the Egyptians that lived there became part of that salad of, of, of cultures. Today's Alexandria is completely Egyptian. And as I understand it now, it is completely taken by the Muslim Brotherhood, kind of. And the people there are very different from the people that used to live in Alexandria. And the, their uh, attitudes are vastly different. They do not understand science. They do not understand modernity. They do not. So that it is going to be a very difficult kind of thing. All he has to do is make sure that he smiles and he explains what he's doing to as many of the people that come in so that they begin to smile themselves and leave him alone. That's really the objective. The, your objective is to take the, Jeep, the ground penetrating radar and do the measurements uh, and, and, uh, and stop them uh, without being stopped. And you can do that only if these people allow you and you cannot get them to allow you unless you make them feel okay and you can make feel them okay by, by explaining to them what you do because underneath this thing, I'm, I'm not looking for gold. I'm not here to pick up to such and such. We are looking here uh, to see what the street was here before, how far the street, uh, how, how thick is this cement between underneath this pavement or whatever. And they say, okay, and they leave you. So it really is a matter of how do you talk to the local people, smile and, and explain to them as much as you possibly can and they will leave you alone because they really are not interested in that because they are not interested in knowledge or in whatever. So just make them feel good about it in, in, in a simple way and, and keep going. A very good point that you make except for the fact that uh, you have to approach it in terms of what they are actually able to understand. Okay. So talk to them, not about the, uh, the, the things that you're gonna get or the model. Get that word model. How many people in Egypt, even college graduates, would understand what a model is? They would. So that you have to be very careful on what is it that people figure out? What is it that, yeah, that that you're talking to them about. And you cannot say that I'm gonna see the work on a model and then figure out what is what is acceptable to them or what is not. I mean, they don't know what's acceptable or what, what do you mean by acceptable? Or what do you mean by the government doing this uh, approach? Or what, is, they, they are not with it as far as these kinds of things are concerned. And you talk to them at, at the level of what they understand only and they will understand street talk about what is it that they need to eat or what is it that comes with the food and, and that's it. So uh, speaking with them with, with any technical language is not proper. And trying to un make them understand what is it you do are doing from the scientific point of view is not true. But trying to, under to uh, make them understand it in terms of what is it that might affect them, yes because you're work taking this machine that's called the ground penetrating radar, you don't have to tell them what it is, and you can actually tell them the GPS, and they will take the GPS rather than the ground penetrating radar, and tell them I have this GPS, which is like a machine, like a, a doctor's kind of thing, and it's measured the thickness and to the, to the pavement, the way it was sometime before this new pavement was put in. Yeah, you get that because this is something that he knows that before this pavement there was another pavement and you want to see the thickness of that between the two pavements yeah. then with in, in in the meantime what is it that's for him so you can tell him that you can do it like this and so that the, 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 when you go over here with your your bike it's you know that it's safe to go to this way so that the pavement is supported by another pavement down there or not. So we might go to other areas and find out that it's not. So meaning that try to get him to understand in whatever you're doing in his or her terms of the kinds of words that they understand. And that's the only way to get to the, to the real people. That when, when you go to, the, 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 Michael was saying something about my going to the desert to see what, what uh, where the, uh, the uh, groundwater might be, take the pictures with you, yes, because they, they would be interested in looking 
and you tell him picture taken from above, you know, the, like a plane, like this, a plane can take this picture. And even the picture from space is farther up, so that, but a plane that flies farther up. And they say, okay, and this is what it is. So you show him first the location of his town. Say, ah, here it is, and the, there is the road that took to such and such. And in the, for, when we look at this here, we see this here that is different from that. Because, when, because it's different, we know that the water used to be there because it looks different. So, yeah. And then we look at such and such, and we, we, we figure out where did this water go? Because there is no water today. Where did it go? It seeped into the rock. That's all right there. I heard that. And then we can figure out that uh -huh, if we go to this. Uh, area and sink the well in here, then we'll find water. As they, they all say, yeah, they figure, they figure it out. So there really, there is a way to connect with the local people everywhere in the world, even in the U.S. Same, same, same kind of thing, by getting them to, uh, to pick up on things that they themselves know or they understand or they have done something like it, and that becomes a, a connection. Uh, it becomes the the link that connects you to them, the benefit to them. Because with NASA, it was a benefit to astronauts. He would do better than the other guys. Yes. And as Muhammad said, it's for the locals. Yeah. So what is the benefit of finding this? Oh, people are going to come here, and you'll find better jobs, and maybe they can build a hotel here. And they'll come to, so there, there has got to be a benefit to the locals, or else to the hell with you. Why do you come here and, and mingle? In, in our territory, our piece of land, and you come here and tell me don't, 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 do, don't raise crops in this segment because it's archaeologically important and who in the hell world are you? So I will suffer so that you can get here and so it's uh, some benefit to the person themselves. And you have to be clever enough to figure out exactly what kind of benefit. Uh, it could be uh, something that is that is not money wise, but or it can be emotional, it can be anything. But you just have to figure out exactly how to present what you're doing to them, so that there will be yes, the benefit to you, benefit to knowledge, benefit to the country and its history, but benefit to you, the the owner. Yeah. Uh, actually, um, one of, one of expertise that I have gained from working from at. Uh, at uh, Minister of Antiquities over uh, more than 15 years, that is how to deal with people. Uh, day by day, uh, we have problems when I was an inspector uh, of archaeology uh, at the Minister of Antiquities. Day by day, we get uh, problems with people, but uh, actually, I don't, I, don't, I, I, I don't like the way that I should deal with them because uh, according to regulation and law i have to uh, uh, be a, a, a sort of uh, officer or something like that to uh, uh, running after them uh, and to uh, but I, actually i don't find this the perfect way to deal with community who are uh, already lived in or within the outline of historical sites uh, so that uh, i and I, I was trying, and look, I, I think I, I, I achieved a little bit uh, uh, success in this field to uh, convince people to get sort of, of course, within my, my, my limited archaeological uh, 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 area, to convince people uh, that this is your heritage. It does it belong to the, the, the government? Government is just here for supervision to preserve your identity. But uh, there is a mislink between uh, 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 preservation uh, 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 approach, uh, traditional preservation approach, and uh, uh, benefits that could be achieved for people. So that uh, I, I, I believe, if I want to uh, succeed uh, in my project, is to get this mislink, uh, 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 which I have explained, how to convince people that we are here to enhance your life. And I think that couldn't be achieved uh, uh, unless we uh, 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 offer 
uh, something to enhance their daily life. Uh, especially now, probably, you know, and Professor Bass as well, you know, you know uh, we, uh, 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 the historical or uh, historical urban fabric, whether in Alexander, Cairo, everywhere in Egypt, uh, 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 exposed to uh, uh, a rush urban pinch, uh, but very, really, uh, 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 very ugly and just aim to get uh, uh, benefits only, to get money only, but with, uh, regardless uh, uh, any uh, 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 historical consideration, any uh, uh, even any any, any uh, 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 architectural uh, dimensions, environmental consideration, etc. For that, we need to now to work uh, uh, steadily to preserve what, what had left from our heritage. Um, heritage, uh, let me explain something. Also, we need to convince people that heritage or archaeology, uh, according to the classic theory, is, uh, uh, archaeology is not gold, is not mummies, is not uh, cemeteries or, uh, or graves. Her uh, heritage uh, and archaeology, or archaeology as a part of our heritage, would be, be uh, achieve some benefit or offer some benefits for daily life or the uh, community. So we need to change. Uh, in, in my opinion, we need to change first of all uh, this misleading or misunderstanding or the classical uh, 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 perception. Uh, uh, to archaeology and heritage, do we uh, to consider the benefit, the benefit of community? We shouldn't deal with them as enemies, because the, uh, after that we leave. We can we can we cannot follow up them uh, uh, over twenty four hours by their day. So that we need to uh, make some engage them in this process if you wanted to succeed uh, by. And achieve some economical benefits, maybe, uh, 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 or micro uh, 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 skills, such as training for traditional uh, art, uh, handcrafts, or, or sort of. Uh, but I think this uh, goal will not be achieved uh, unless we get support from uh, 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 local governments or other uh, stakeholders. Uh, on the, uh, the scale of governmental authorities, such as uh, uh, Alexandre Governorate, uh, uh, National Organization of Urban Harmony, uh, Ministry of Antiquities, etc., and also basically businessmen of Alexandria. I good luck, Mohammed. You're doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Elbaz, for sharing your time and knowledge with us today. We would love to have you back to explore more of your impressive experience. Thank you, Dr. Solomon, for staying late to speak with us. We are looking forward to continuing our discussion about your project.